themselves all work. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to welcome everybody who's here in person. This is the first in-person reading that we've done in, I would say, two years. Um, so it's lovely to be here and with you, and I thank you. And thank you, everybody who's Zooming. Um, I hope you're all in your pajamas and comfortable and uh, that you'll enjoy our program. Uh, Irene and I are both caregivers. So tonight we're reading poems about our work where we really interact with humans at the most extreme limits of their existence. Um, I will introduce Irene in a minute and she'll start our reading. But I also wanna let you know that we're doing things a little bit differently. Normally in a reading, one poet reads and then the next poet reads after that. We're going to go back and forth a little bit only because it's a little interesting to see how our poems play off of each other, the intertwining of the voices. And also, um, I don't know what Irene is gonna read. Irene doesn't know what I'm gonna read. So it'll be interesting for us too, just to see how the mind and the body connection. So uh, after we read, we're open for questions and answers uh, from all of you folks at home also. And uh, we, I have some books for sale if anybody would like to uh, donate to my life as a writer. So Irene, Irene Sherlock is a dual licensed marriage and family therapist and alcohol and drug counselor. She lives and practices in Danbury. Her poems, essays, and short stories have been published in Alimentum, Chautauqua Literary Journal, Cloven Sphere, Cream City Review, Connecticut Review, Dos Passos Review, Eclipse, Fairfield Review, Intima, Miranda Magazine, Poem Memoir Story, Poet Lore, Poetry Motel, Primavera, Runes, Strip Sleam, Slip Stream, Tar Wolf Review, The New York Times, White Pelican Review, and she is anthologized in several anthologies. Uh, her chapbook, Equinox, was published by Finishing Line Press, and she's working on another book uh, right now. So it's my pleasure to introduce Irene, and I'm just going to go over here and go, got it? Amy, do I need to get that off of my screen or no? What it says the meeting is being recorded and it's like right in front of everything. Okay, that's fine. Is that okay? Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Irene. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Really appreciate you being here. And thank you everyone at home. Yeah, it's interesting. You can't even see. Okay, I assume you're all there. Uh, <laughs> Uh, thank you to Amy for coordinating this, and um, thank you to Mothership on Maine who supplies the cookies. So please help yourself. There's some beverages back there if you're hungry or thirsty. So this first poem is called Red Beret. This morning there was frost-darkened blood on my porch deck, a trail disappearing reddish into the hoary winter lawn. I imagined a wild injured thing, a skunk or feral cat, how it couldn't change its fate and die on a warm porch. Instead, afraid, left behind a swath of crimson on my glass storm door. I saw and put together a life receding while I slept, a life drawing shallow breaths beneath the tall pines it struggled to reach at the edge of my night yard. Now the day already drawn down, a client sits across from me weeping. Her son has overdosed again, is somehow alive again, she says, again. The women in her Al-Anon group this morning told her let go and let God. Now she removes the red beret she wears and tousled blonde escapes into the now warm room. She finds my eyes. I say what I say. Soon she tells about the new granddaughter, her own eyes clear. How beautiful the child is, just born, she exclaims. Making her next appointment later, I look up and see wisps of blonde being stuffed back into her beret. I marvel at how she lifts herself, grasping her handbag to make her way across the carpet 
and out to the porch, turning to wave through the glass door. How firmly she pulls her red beret down against the wind with one free hand. Rorschach. Above my desk, a flock of yellow birds look out from a white canvas. They stare, inky eyes, orange beaks, streaks of feathered green. Yellow birds, some close, some distant on a branch from an unseen tree. Clients want to know what it means. I like it, they'll say, as if appreciating art means they're not too far gone. No one wants to be too far gone. When I'm making their next appointment, they'll search my bookcase, scan titles about couples therapy, eating disorders, addiction. One man stands and inspects my license. A regular turns on the fan each week complaining about the heat. Almost everyone helps themselves to the candy jar, Tootsie Rolls, sneakers, Snickers. <laughs> they tell me about their next court date or their crazy ex and how dare that son of a bitch say I started it. They sit across from me and tell me things and sometimes ask about the birds in the painting. I have no real answer except to say it's a gift from my niece, an artist. The man yesterday fingered his appointment card, cocked his head, seeming uneasy with this explanation. Or maybe he was thinking about the rain pelting the window, how it's a long walk down the hill to the bus stop. Two men, a summer evening. My last client of the day in my home office, a house painter, his pants spattered, baseball cap pulled down, sitting in shadow, yet I saw his high. Yeah, he confirmed. His dealer found him. I can't get away, his voice certain, his lot has fixed as dusk settling. Outside, katydids made themselves heard, cicadas buzz near flowering hydrangeas at my open window. The hour before, a grizzled man long in recovery, mowed careful symmetry, <clears throat> a million blades of green shifting light, them back. He keeps the lush grass long to hide imperfections, shelter from the scorch of sun. Today he'd left zucchini tomatoes his wife had grown. I'd slice them once the painter left, but he was still talking. I said his name. Our time was up. He looked over, surprised at where he was, then motioned to an abstract on the wall. Is that new? He fixed his gaze on me, smiled. You live alone, have a husband? I stood, he got to his feet swaying. Outside insects called from the earth's floor, a swarm of katydids, crickets drumming my evening lawn. Or was it my heart I heard strumming insistent as he strode past, left the room. The antidote to addiction is connection, emphasizes the physician as I pause my virtual training, go down to the kitchen for late night apple and cheese. Through the window, I glimpse the sky and outside in bathrobe slippers, snap a picture of the night, a scattering of stars and full moon. Before sleep, I post the image to Facebook Next morning, someone I haven't seen in years likes my night. In our 20s, she and I would finish our restaurant shift, sit drinking Chardonnay. Less lived in our bones back then, she barely mentioned her college rape, how she dropped out afterwards. Instead, we vowed to see Italy, live on pasta and wine. But I started college. I heard she went to rehab. The night she messaged on Facebook, she was gray-haired, sober, 32 years, smiling in her profile picture. I barely knew the woman with the grandchild on her lap. Still, she remembered, asked, did you ever see Italy? No, not yet. 
I'm going to introduce Courtney. It's my privilege. As a registered nurse and then as a nurse practitioner, Courtney worked in the operating room, intensive care, oncology, and for many years in women's health. She's the author of five poetry collections, most recently Daughter, and I hear their voices singing poems, new and selected, which are for sale somewhere afterwards. Um, her nonfiction publications include When the Nurse Becomes a Patient, A Story in Words and Images, and The Heart's Truth, Essays on the Art of Nursing. She's co-editor of three anthologies of creative writing by nurses. Her honors include an NEA Poetry Fellowship, three Connecticut Commission on the Arts Poetry Grants, two Connecticut Center for the Book Awards, and six Books of the Year Awards from the American Journal of Nursing. Court Courtney served as the first Poet Laureate of Bethel, Connecticut from 2019 to 2021. Please welcome Courtney Davis. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, I never really wanted to be a nurse, um, but I ended up being one. My, my first experience with nurses was when I was about, I think I was about 12 or 13, and I had fallen off a horse during a riding lesson. And a week later, all of a sudden, I started having some physical symptoms. <clears throat> and um, this is a poem about that time. It's called Blood Clot. I got sleepy. My right side became lazy, then wouldn't move. Inside my lids, a plush curtain turned my friend's face into a ripe tomato. Mother's purple violets against the porcelain kitchen sink became that thick pulse stopped in my brain. At 12, I never wanted to be a nurse, but head down on my arms at the table, I sensed the potential in disorder. My friend chattered to keep me awake while my father phoned the doctor. When he said, emergency, dad opened a can of Campbell's bean and bacon soup, stirred it slowly in mom's enamel pan. Keep talking, he told my friend, while I obediently spooned with my good left hand the dusty aftertaste of soup he'd make me finish first. When all I wanted were alarms, women in white bright enough to burn, running with me in their arms. When at last I was delivered to their headlong rush, their quick needles in my vein, their silent bedside vigil I could count on, I vowed I would always love their way, fierce, physical, then they returned me healed to that calm, silent kitchen. So of course I ended up being a nurse um, and I learned that uh, as Irene knows, we have many stories in our work with our patients and our clients. I did my psychiatric rotation many, many years ago at uh, Fairfield Hospital. Does everybody remember the Fairfield Psychiatric Institution? It was. It's been closed many years, but it was a uh, it was an interesting place. <clears throat> and when I was a student, uh, a group of students, uh, and I think it was second year, we did a rotation there, uh, and we had to learn to interact with patients. Psychiatric rotation. The snow that December fell in drifts, white as our support hose and clinic shoes. As we slipped our way into the building's steamy rush, place, faces, sorry, faces slapped by heat, we climbed to the men's ward and lined up like children, while nurses in jeans and t-shirts, their keys a silver jingle, bent over meds or forms ignoring us. Finally, a man on a white lab coat led us around the ward, reciting names and diagnoses, what meds worked or didn't. Who were the biters, kickers, screamers? Until the charge nurse said, welcome to the loony bin, that guy is a patient. Our instructor shared the joke, passed out our assignments, men with whom we'd bond, spin words into a process report, recording our every question and their response as we tried out the magic 
we'd only read about. My guy was young, scary, tall, blonde, forelock, carried his guitar, nodded at my name, motioned me into a side room where he played his songs, wouldn't talk. And I sat legs crossed, hands in lap, starched cap, blue uniform, stiff as my cheeks, my heart poom pooming when he stood and locked the door. The ward outside was blurred by the trick of glass, a smear of patience pacing, the faint chink of keys, and me without one. No escape, a bird trapped in the eaves, a dog chained. I sat, didn't move, didn't flail my wings or howl for help, didn't move. Sweat damp, stale air only half drawn in, muscles locked, don't flinch, don't scream. I checked my watch and lied. Oh, look, all the student nurses have to leave and I'll be left behind. Smiled the words at him and he rose, slung down his guitar, unlocked the door. The next week he was gone, my grade an F, my report blank, only the terror of the silent page. A nurse with black hair, blue eyes told me, my boy'd been agitated all afternoon. That night threw an orderly down the laundry chute, killing him. Shit happens here, she said, and gave me an easy one. An old man I danced with that Friday afternoon. Social hours. Us student nurses waltzing with any man not too drugged to move. Old tinny phonograph. All of us shuffling around the floor to the music's whine. an unforgettable experience. Later on in my uh, career, um, I started nursing in the intensive care unit. And then for a long time, I was a uh, head nurse of the Danbury Hospital's first oncology unit, <clears throat> cancer ward many years ago again. And uh, this is a story about one of our patients. And uh, in, the, in the poem, I call her Marion. The poem is called Stoned. Marion asked for grass. You know, she said, it's true. It's not the dying, but the pain. Her friends brought in an ounce. And when Marion grew too weak to build her little cigarettes, I'd assign a nurse to help. One day the supervisor stopped outside our patient's door. Smell that, she asked. I shook my head. You must be used to it, she laughed, the smell of death. Then I could smell it too, behind the pungent smoke, a scent slightly off, a little edge to it, like old perfume. We didn't speak. Around us, cancer-killing poisons dripped slowly into veins. Everyone was turned and turned again to keep skin from breaking down where ribs and bones poked through, and all the patient's wounds were bound. Here's what I remember, how Marion laughed as we nurses with our flimsy cures pushed every chair against her door to keep death out. And when we couldn't, how Marion called us hungry, stoned. One of the things that has happened to me in my nursing career, and I think it probably happens to Irene too, is we tend to bring our patients home with us. Um, you know, even when we leave our the hospital or our office, um, we, we carry our patients with us. So this poem has quite a, a long title. I bring my patients home with me to the apartment on Ferris Avenue. It's beige kitchen with wood veneer cabinets, wax buildup on the linoleum floor, light from the parking lot slant through plastic blinds. While I sleep off my night shift in a sweaty shroud of sheets, my patients wait in the living room, their monitors shouting ding, 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 or they wander about watching TV with my kids and husband, canned laughter flickering back and forth between the two bedrooms separated by the one bathroom, its blue leaking bowl. Usually I only tell other nurses how I wake and try to silence the alarms how I feel the fabric of my patient's fragile cotton Johnny coats brush my skin. 
On summer nights, we play rummy with our neighbors, my patients silent behind me, holding their intravenous poles. Days when I'm not at work, I gossip with the mothers in the parking lot, all of us in shorts, rolling our kids' strollers back and forth, my patients standing near me, the sun setting over us, turning the brick apartment building gold. You know how it happens. One day you'll think back and suddenly it seems as if you're remembering someone else's life. Now Irene's gonna read again. Okay. Honey. Rich with food stamps, my grandmother roasted Sunday chicken. She in her one good dress, me her only guest, cloth napkin in her lap, my lap, sorry. Let me start over. Me her only guest, cloth napkin in my lap. Honey, pass the gravy, she'd say. Years later, a red-haired banquet manager tasked with training me smoothed the white tablecloth, then moved the water glass to just above the dinner knife. Goes here, honey, she said. Yesterday at the eye doctor's, the assistant put cold drops into each eye. I checked my phone. She drew close. You got to close your eyes, honey, so your eyes can dilate. After that, the doctor came and bent to look into the back. The far back offered reassurance. I don't say the sweet word, but sometimes now someone will remember being bullied on the bus or whisper about drunk dad hitting and hitting or being scared at sleepaway camp. How she wrote letters and nobody came. She had to stay all summer. I look over, nod. Oh, honey, honey. Um, I came to this profession late in life, I, uh, 10 years ago. Um, <laughs> I did a lot of other things before, but um, I was fortunate enough to work at MCCA for seven years and they taught me everything I know about addiction. They are, they were an incredible, resource for me and I was just, I consider myself so fortunate. And this is a poem that came out of my experience working when I used to do men's groups, which is something we did a lot of. It's called Progress Notes. Pushing through the double doors at work, I think about my brother in the hospital, who I'll call before men's group at five. Tired guys who yawn and say their stomachs growling, how, to, how they're better than raking leaves, lifting garbage, but that's all they can get with a record. Men who've owned and lost businesses, wives, children, middle-aged, tatted-up men with goatees who tell the young ones, don't be like me, get this now. Young ones slunk down behind hoodies, push back their Yankee hats. Someone says his mouth waters just driving through the neighborhood where he scored. They up, the others nod, swear, look over at me, apologize. They stay clean for their mothers, kids, probation. Fuck probation, someone says. I think about the times I drove drunk, how I was never caught or crashed, and now I'm sitting in this chair and there and that. My brother's in a hospital states away, conscious, but I don't know that yet as I settle into my office as men descend stairs, disperse into a darkened parking lot, they'll light up cigarettes. Someone will offer another a ride home. They'll follow each other down the road. And while they do, I'll pull up their charts. The only sound clicks on a keyboard. Client was emotional, grateful to his boss who will hold his job while he serves 45 days for his last DUI. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we didn't know what was going to happen. People in my field, you know, where our clients were saying, well, I'll see you when we're back in person. And of course, that didn't happen for a long time. So 
we um, all got used to doing telehealth and there are some clients that I have never met in person. It's kind of amazing, but anyway, this is called early days. The first weeks we took to our homes, businesses shut, schools canceled. I woke tired, kept distant in supermarkets, waved to others on the road. As a therapist, I Zoomed to meet the man with three kids who lost his restaurant job. Then the woman whose mother, 90, was confused without her daughter's weekly visits. A teenage client moved her eye phone around the room. Watch this doc, she said, showing off a thousand piece puzzle sorted by color, pattern, and assembled border. I slept a full night after I turned off the news and played Yo-Yo Ma, the Beatles. Mornings, I purged files, sorted cooking magazines unread for years, simmered beans with ham, thyme, ate by candlelight the table set with cloth and wine. Every day I sought the guarantee of my yard, dragging the wheelbarrows of mulch spread with bare hands. Delicate green shot up and the second week I arranged cut branches of forsythia, made salad of dandelion greens, cleaned the bird bath, watched a titmouse drink from the ceramic bowl. Today, I Zoomed with a client sitting in her kitchen by an open door. Yesterday, her daughter's hamster died. After tears and a backyard ceremony, the child opened Monopoly. A grown son put down his cell. The microwave hummed as the family waited for popcorn. Her husband, who traveled for years, rolled dice across a colorful board. I listened as outside a wren or skylark or maybe a robin sang from beyond an open window, its repetition clear, familiar. I listened, hoping to learn more. Seventeen pocketbooks. The man who lost his wife of 51 years is trying to figure out if he wants to live. The kids are not enough, he says. Even asleep, I keep reaching for her. They had cocktails every night, whiskey sours on the weekend. He, his wife liked the little smoked sausages they got at Costco. He tried to get her to watch her cholesterol, but she said, gotta die of something. Four months and he still can't remove the glass of water by her nightstand. Can't take her toothbrush from its cup or the face cream from the vanity. He's going through her things though, the kids insisted. She had 17 pocketbooks, he says in disbelief. He describes her favorite, a green leather handbag, went perfect with her fuchsia lipstick, she used to say. One of them is a suede thing I thought was so ugly, a hippie thing, but I never said nothing, she loved it. In the bottom of a denim satchel, a blue comb threaded with gray blonde hairs he will never throw out. And in a checkered beach bag, one sandal tangling her sunglasses in its frayed strap, also in a black velvet clutch, a crumpled pack of Salem's. She was sneaking. He has unearthed a wife he hasn't quite known. He didn't want the bags to go to Goodwill as his daughter suggested. So instead, each night he picks a different pocketbook, lays it on her pillow, and sometimes uncaps the fuchsia lipstick as well. 14. Okay. Everybody okay? Yeah. Um, I worked the, the last several years of my working experience, I worked in women's health. And uh, here's a couple of poems from that time. Examining the abused woman. Her face when she turns is like a peach left in the refrigerator drawer too long, nose and cheek caved in as if underneath the fleshy matrix has been chewed away. When I ask past medical history, she lists the broken bones, humorous, 
ulna, sternum, nose, jaw twice, eye socket, she points here. I palpate her face, dip my fingers in the little valley of her clavicle, scared to press too hard. I see her bare. She breathes, I listen with the stethoscope, her breath like wind drawn down a New York alleyway all the time we talk. I memorize her puffy feet, the scars that rise like topographic map, maps across her abdomen. Pan slicked with lubricant, I probe to touch her ovaries, hold her uterus between my open palms. She says she lives in Westchester, a home of sorts. I finish the exam, she dresses and not looking up, thanks me for being kind. How could I say it's no use to hate? Or I bless you with my fingertips. It's me who is afraid. One afternoon a week, we have what we call the, uh, the teen clinic when the pregnant teenagers were all seen you know, one afternoon. Um, and that was uh, it just the picture of these teenagers just stays in my mind. Every day, the pregnant teenagers assemble at my desk, backpacks jingling, beepers on their belts like hand grenades, and inside their babies swirl like multicolored pinwheels in a hurricane. The girls raise two big smocks, show me the stretch tight skin from under which a foot or hand thumps, knocks, makes the belly wobble. A girl strokes her invisible child, recites all possible names, as if a name might carry laundry down the street or fix a Chevrolet. I measure months with a paper tape, maneuver the cold stethoscope that lifts a fetal heart swoosh into air. Then, shirts billowing like parachutes, the girls fly to Filene's where infant shoes on sale have neon strobes and satin bows. Oh, Renee, Shalika, Blanca Marie, the places you'll go, the places you'll go. Um, one thing I think that happens to caregivers is we often end up caring for our own families uh, in many ways. Uh, so this is just a, a little poem about um, that situation. It's called Washing Mother's Hair. One, houses disappeared in snow. Okay. Pine trees tossed down sparrows frozen to their bones. We buried them in shoebox graves, birds' ghosts like my prayers puffed into air. At night, we'd watch as cars slid sideways down our icy road. Dead man's hill, my mother said. Then she'd comb my hair. Her thin black comb following her hand until my hair sparked stars that melted everywhere. Two, November's winds increase and sparrows reappear as black winged geese. Yesterday, we washed my mother's hair. Hold her head above the pan, I told him, and my father held her baby skull, warm water from the pitcher, thin gray hair. Tonight, the first fog of snow into which geese and memories disappear and my mother, my star, half seen, then vanishing. White moths everywhere. As I rake leaves from my parents' graves and plant new bulbs in the dark earth that holds my father's ashes in a plastic box and my mother's body in a rose-colored casket, a white moth arrives, rising and falling on the warm breeze, lingers on the headstone, then on my bare arm, clinging as if searching for moist skin or the scent of me, until I stop it with my finger, a little barrier to discourage its tickly legs, the soft hammer of its trapped powdery wings. The rest of the day fluttering from the grass like tiny torn messages, white moths follow me everywhere. Irene is going to read two poems. I'm going to read two poems, and then we will be open for questions, comments, and cookies. So. Okay. 
They make up stories about me, my clients, whether I'm married, divorced, straight or gay, a single parent or childless. Perhaps they wonder if I'm vegan or a Buddhist. And occasionally they ask, but mostly I'm learning them. Though sometimes I make up what they make up when they visit my web website, considered my photo. And what do they think when they pull up to my home office, peruse the tended perennials? Do they picture a hired gardener or me in dungarees and trowel? or an artist me, unknowable, as they peruse my artwork? Do they take in the fragrant apples in the bowl on my counter? Imagine me making pie the way my hairdresser muses about me, then goes on about the photos on her station, her own life, or else the restaurant with the arugula and the goat cheese salad. I vow to report back next time. My clients know ours is a one-way street. Even so, when I'm planning a hiatus, they occasionally ask, going someplace good? I don't tell them if I'm off to Mexico or that I'm going to visit a sick friend or that I'll be home cleaning out the basement. Ah, yes, I say, and walk them to the door. I work as a therapist so I can listen to the man who won't stop drinking. Yesterday, his wife threatened to leave, but he knows I won't. And hear about the boy beaten with his stepfather's belt, the harder when he began to cry, how welts etch themselves in memory. The woman whose husband left years ago, I hear ache in her voice saying, she take him back in a heartbeat even now. Chocolates on my desk, an offering. A towel to dry a woman who arrived today gasping in a downpour. Years ago, I worked at other things, made better money. But now I choose instead the sanctuary of this office. It's matching pattern chairs and box of tissues. I listen like the mother they never had, like the mother I always wanted to be, delighted about the new baby sad about the lost cat. I laugh at the team doing stand-up in my office and breathe in and out around another's panic. I hold my breath as they do, take in their sorrows, the miscarriage, car crash. All these beating hearts reaching out, one by one they seat themselves in front of me, all flesh and bone and nerve. Thank you. Somewhere. I wanted to um, at least read one poem in tribute to all of the caregivers who are working during the pandemic. Uh, I have a friend whose name is Stacy, and she works in uh, the emergency room in a hospital in Houston, and they've been overwhelmed. Um, so I, I wrote this poem for her. My friend Stacy works in the emergency room. And during the pandemic sparks a love for classical music. On her way to work listens to Pavarotti, the audio clip of his debut at 26, filling in for the great Giuseppe Di Stefano, perhaps disappointing the audience, but they cheered when Pavarotti sang high C, that impossible note, as unforgettable as the faces, as the faces of the patients overcome by the virus as suddenly as a young tenor might bring the audience to their feet. I love how the crowd was blown away, she tells me, while all around her the cries of families not allowed to be with the dying. And making ER rounds, my friend holds music in her pocket. Some days it's Mozart's coronation mass, especially the credo, something to believe in as she pauses at each patient's bed. Other days, it's Amor Sacro by Vivaldi, a priest who composed music in his head during mass, 
held a rosary until taking up a pen to write an opera. And during a code when the ER is a chaos of shouts and mechanical chimes, when sweat soaks masks and gowns, and doctors pump a patient's chest, breaking ribs that cage a suffering heart. It's then my friend plays Bach's Goldberg variations, music for the pianist Goldberg to play every night to soothe the sleepless count, music that now marks time with all that must be done to keep a soul alive, sounds more beautiful than the hiss and whoosh, the final dead air space of silence. And after, turned low, an aria for the team's joined hands, for the rituals they say over each ruined body. Music become words, blessings my friend and her team offer every day, every night, and then again. Okay, my last poem is called Enso, E-N-S-O, uh, which is a Japanese word that means circle. And I think you've all seen the, you know, the, the circle drawn with the black ink, it's drawn in one fell swoop, hopefully. Uh, and it means wholeness, wholeness. And so, birth is the beginning, my Buddhist friend says. Even opening a cereal box at dawn is the beginning, the way the separate grains meld into something new, milk drizzled from a pitcher, blackberries on a silver spoon. And every breath seems new, he says, sacred as the morning prayers of the devout. On my ward today, two patients died. Death is also a beginning, my friend says. It's like closing out the lights at night to summon sleep. The possibilities are endless. Constellations, a new moon easing into sight. Listen, he says and I hear their voices singing. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. If anyone has questions, comments here or there, um, we'd be happy to answer. I just want to say my hairdresser is here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> there are cookies and refreshments in the back. Um, I don't know if anyone at home has any comments or questions. And anyone here? Uh, Can you hear? Um, yes. To hear. Hear. Yes. Yes. Uh, Courtney, it's Francis. I just wanted to say. Congratulations to you and Irene, Francis from St. John Paul too. Hi, Francis. Hi, beautiful, Hi. both of you, beautiful. Thank, Thank you, you so much. We go back 37 years at St. John Paul. We do. <laughs> Francis and I worked together many years ago, 37 years ago. I beat, I beat 37 when I was a child and drove you in my house to I know, <laughs> I know, I know. Thank you, Alexis. Okay, yes. I, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so I, I wonder whether making poems has helped you, I don't want to use the word better, but has helped you become the nurse and the therapist that you in your heart would want to be. And how, how does the making of poems make any difference how you, there. Um, don't do it the microphone down there. Um, um, I think, I, well, I can answer and then I'll let Irene answer. I think that in order to be, oh, asking if, if writing poems made us be a better nurse or a better therapist. Courtney, I want to not change the word better because I'm a little uncomfortable with that, but to become the nurse or the therapist that you feel yeah. you would like to be. Okay. You, um, I mean, different speaking, than better. Yes. I think um, as a nurse, I have to be particularly attentive to the patient's stories, to their 
appearances to their movements, um, you know, trying to see what's below the surface. I think in writing a poem, I'm also interested in what's below the surface. Uh, so I think that writing poems makes me a better nurse. Being a nurse makes me a more uh, aware poet. So. Mm. Um, gee, that's an interesting question. Here, I'm buying time here. Um, <laughs> You know, I don't know. I, I love writing poetry and I had not been writing any poetry until I started doing this work. And then I just wanted to explore the work uh, through poetry. And so I think mm. they're kind of like two things. And um, we do a lot of listening. I'm sure, you know, it's the same for you, but when you were doing your work, a lot of listening and um, I, I, can I think about that and get back to you? Whoever that is? So that's a really interesting question. Sure. Maybe the, the next reading. Uh, so I, oh. I have a question. <clears throat> yes. Hi there. Uh, Courtney, Irene, I know you both for a long time. I remember when you both sort of appeared in my life. Connie. And Connie. I, you, you struck me both as being... A, so different, and in some ways, so alike. I think it took me a long time before I realized that it was this sensitivity to other people and to the conditions around you that really startled me. And I do wonder, because I've listened to both of you at varying times, Courtney, uh, a lot uh, back in the day, and then... Uh, certainly, Irene, I have known consistently over the years, Courtney, I have read your poetry, but I haven't really heard you speak. And I have noticed that both of you have grown enormously. <clears throat> Irene uh, used to write, I, I believe, essays as well and uh, short stories. Um, but the poetry seems to have blossomed in the many years since I've known you. Uh, so can either of you identify a time when you focused, when you suddenly said, we got a little when you said, I, I am a poet, or I want to do this, and decided to develop it even further? And I'll start with Courtney, because I'm going to put her on the spot right now. Um, I should say the question. She's... She's asking if there was a particular time during which we felt that we were poets. And yeah, now, it's locked up. Um, now it's locked up. A couple of years ago, I went to a conference and they gave me a name tag and it said Courtney Davis Poet. And when I looked at it, I went, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I would say that even though poetry is a really important part of my life, I don't really think of myself as, as a poet. Um, so I don't know. Well, I'm gonna um, give a different answer maybe than the one Connie. This is our friend Connie that, how long have we been, you know, 40, 40, 50 years? I don't know, a long time. And I remember going into a, a writing workshop and Courtney got up and read a poem. And I was a freshman in college, uh, non-trad student. And I heard her read a poem and I thought, I want to do that. So I didn't say I want to write poetry, but I just knew I loved it. I fell in love with the form, you know, um, slowly. And it's still even hard for me to identify myself as a poet, even though I love writing poetry. So once again, I don't know if that's a good answer, or even an it's answer. It's a good answer. They're both uh, Irene, can, can you hear us? Irene, can you hear us? Yes, yes. It's Shelley and Ira. Oh. <laughs> Joe Fisher, I'm just going to announce you to the group here. He's a wonderful poet. Yes, thank you. Well, I'm I'm just heard two wonderful poets, and what an honor it is to be virtually in your company. Uh, I, I liked the photograph you put on Facebook today about the snow on the tree on on your lawn. But uh, thank you for for your tender and insightful poems, uh, Courtney. My heavens, bless you for being a nurse. And Irene, bless you for being a counselor, but bless both of you for being poets. How good it is to hear you, 
how good it is to see you. And th thank you for including us in the evening. Thank you, thank Ira you. and Shelley. Thank you. I know there was a couple of people here who had their hands up. Oh, could, could I ask a question? 